I want to welcome you to worship this morning on this beautiful spring day. It has finally sprung, and I'm just so grateful to be here uh, worshiping God with you. And if you're visiting this morning, we especially want to welcome you to worship here at Calvary. Uh, we're a community that's constantly uh, changing. And uh, one of the ways that we're changing is these young girls here are growing up and becoming who God has called them to be. And uh, some of them are a little bit crazy, my daughter. Um, <laughs> but they're going to help us lead in worship today. And um, so this is what we're doing. We're doing Gem Sunday. It used to be called Calvinettes. Uh, talked to someone on the Wednesday night dinner who was here when they were, in, I think, eight years old, and they never attended the church as an adult. But so we've been doing this thing for a long time, uh, this girls' club thing called Calvinettes. Uh, now it's called Gems, and uh, they're going to help lead us in worship today. So I invite you to stand, and the Gems are going to come up here, and they're going to help us sing. Here we go. You are holy. You are holy. You are mighty. You are mighty. You are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. I will follow. I will follow. I will listen. And I will live my life for you. Here we go. You are holy. You are holy. You are mighty. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. I will follow. And I will live my life for you. You're my Prince of Peace. You're my Prince of Peace. And I will live my life for you. All right, great job. All right, I don't think anybody uh, told you girls that I was going to put you on the spot. Uh, but uh, your counselor said that uh, my best friend is a really a song you really like. Why do you like this song so much? <laughs> That's what I was afraid of. All right. Well, I think you like this song so much because even though Jesus is God and, and our Savior, he's also our best friend, right? Oh, okay. All right. All right. Okay, well, here we go. We're going to sing this song now.
Have you heard of the one called Savior? Have you heard of his perfect love? Have you heard of the one in heaven? Have you heard how he gave his son? Savior. I believe he's the risen one. I believe that I'll live forever. I believe that the king will come. So I have found this. Show me your way. Jesus, you are my best friend. You are my best friend. Nothing will ever change that. Jesus, you are my best friend. You will always be. I believe in the one called Savior. I believe he's the risen one. I believe that I'll live forever. I believe that the King will come. So I promise. I believe in this. Show me your friend. Jesus, you are my best friend. You will always be. Nothing will ever change that. 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 You are my best friend. Nothing will ever be. Jesus, you are my best friend. Never always be. Nothing will ever change. Sing it again. Jesus, you are my best friend. You will always be. Nothing will ever change. Jesus, you are my best friend. You will always be. All right, you may take a seat, and the gems, you may have a seat, too. Yeah, the amazing thing about those songs, uh, we are singing some awesome truths that even though God is the Lord, the Master, the King of all the earth, um, He is also um, our best friend. And we can come to Him and walk with Him day by day in fellowship with Him. And so mm -hmm. uh, this song is so appropriate, uh, a song by Keith Green. Uh, let's sing about the beauty of our Lord. Your eyes are on this child 
your grace abound to me I want to take your word and shine it all around but first help me just to live it Lord and when I'm doing well help me to never seek a crown for my reward is giving glory to you oh Lord please light the fire that once burned bright and clear replace the lamp of my first love that burns with holy fear I want to take your word and shine it all around but first help me just to live it Lord and when I'm doing well help me to never seek a crown for my reward is giving glory to you oh Lord oh Lord you're beautiful your face is all I seek and when your eyes are on this child your grace abounds to me let's sing that last phrase again and when and when your eyes are on this child your grace abounds to me let's pray for just a moment father as we continue in worship hearing about announcements and prayer concerns and giving our offerings Lord, we ask that you'd help us stay up in this truth in our minds that you are the way the truth the life that you're beautiful that you offer us every good thing and this morning as we talk about uh, the mundane but also the divine we ask that you yourself would come into our lives and show us your way the most excellent way the most excellent way of following you Jesus your Lord I ask invite you to be Lord in this place Lord in our lives I ask that you would sit on the throne of our hearts so that our lives can be directed by you in Jesus name we pray amen so we'll get a chance to say hi to each other in a moment, but I just want to invite you, to, I mean, I want to welcome you to, uh, to Calvary Church. If you're a member here, um, you kind of know how this goes, so I don't have to explain anything to you, but if you're visiting and you'd like to get to know us better, you can fill out uh, one of those visitor cards in front of you. Also, if you have a prayer concern, you can put that in there and put that in the offering um, a little later. Um, we just want to be a community together, and so there's all sorts of ways we do that. Um, the bulletin is one of those ways. There's some announcements in there that you can read. There's also a lot of prayer concerns in there. Really, the only announcement that I have this morning is that there is a new members class this afternoon at three, uh, from 3 to 5 p.m. So if you've been here for a while and you would like to investigate becoming an official member of Calvary, sort of committing to Calvary for uh, a longer period of time, you can do that. And I really don't want to be inside this afternoon, so we're going to do it in our backyard of our house. Um, so if you want to be part of that, just come over to the house about 3 o'clock. And I live right across there with all the cars and camper in front of it. A little bit of car litter over there. Um, but come on over, 3 o'clock, and uh, we'll talk somewhere and we'll have a little bit of food afterwards too. So that's the main announcement. Uh, the prayer concerns and good news are along these lines. First of all, Jim and Mary Vanderplug. Mary is in the hospital yet again. Uh, sort of the same thing. Um, loss of consciousness and some other things going on. So please pray for Jim and Mary. Uh, they really uh, continue to go through a lot of difficult things. Um, it's cold season. There's been some colds in our house for a long time. Um, but Brent kind of sent me a note last night. He has the flu and is just really bad in the middle of uh, getting ready to do his exams. So please pray for Brent 
and everybody else who's uh, dealing with difficulty that way too. Um, I know so many of you have family members that are sick. I want to continue to pray for that, as well as uh, Dave, who's, I think, still struggling, right? Yeah. But there is good news, too. Um, and Leon, can I ask you to do this one more time? Can you come up? This is so cool. Come on up, Leon. Have a mic. All right, so for those of you who don't know, um, Leon's has been losing feeling in his legs for quite some time, and something great happened. I'll just let you take it away. Yeah, something great happened. Tell it yet again, and, and then show us what you can do. <laughs> All right, well, yes, I've been uh, having this numbness uh, in my feet and legs uh, probably for close to the last 10 years, and just kind of gradually getting worse. And... Um, so I've been, of course, asking the doctors and other people, well, what's causing this? And over the years, all kinds of tests were done. Uh, almost everything you can think of, I was uh, uh, prodded and poked and uh, electric shocked and everything else, trying to find out what's wrong. And uh, uh, finally, I uh, uh, went to a, uh, uh, oh, and that was, it was diagnosed as peripheral neuropathy. And so I went to a peripheral neuropathy support group meeting, and uh, the, uh, the head of the neurology department of the University of Michigan uh, was there as the speaker. And afterwards, I went up to her, and I described to her my symptoms. And she says, well, maybe you've got lumbar stenosis. And she says, why don't you come on over to the U of M and let us do some testing. So I started doing that. Uh, that was about two years ago. And uh, had an MRI done of the lower part of my back, <clears throat> which would be to check if there's lumbar stenosis, and there wasn't any. Didn't find anything. And they were running through all kinds of tests. And finally, this uh, doctor who was the head of the neurology department, she says, you know, we just aren't finding anything. And she says, some of your symptoms kind of tell me that maybe you don't have peripheral neuropathy. She says, let's do an MRI of the rest of your back. So they did. I had that done. That was done uh, right at Christmas time. <clears throat> and bam, there it was, a tumor about this big in the middle of my back. Hmm. And it never hurt. I never had any pain. It wouldn't have been found who knows when if this doctor just didn't stay persistent about finding it. <clears throat> so the um, problem was that uh, that had to get out of there or things were just going to keep getting worse and worse. And it didn't matter that as a tax accountant, it was tax season, uh, <laughs> it, had to, <laughs> it had to get out. So I had surgery in February. They were able to remove 98% of the tumor. There, uh, it was benign. And uh, uh, the uh, problem with, the, with what the tumor was doing was that it was pressing against my spinal cord and cutting off the communication. So instead of my spinal cord being like it should be straight, it was like this. And it was cutting, and that's what was probably causing most of this. Now, it's a long time for nerves to come back, and uh, so we're still hoping and praying that a lot more uh, feeling is going to come back, but some has come back already. I'm already able to walk around and move around better than I could before the, the surgery. So if you remember, Lan was always really hesitant, but can, can you just do what you did before? Just, can you do it this morning? Can you, can you dance? Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Okay. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, uh, this isn't, anyway, uh, it's amazing to see you dance in church to move, and this is truly an answer to prayer. So how this works is God doesn't answer every prayer like we, like we, uh, like we hope, like we want, but he does answer prayers, and he does promise to be with us in every difficulty, and this was a long time coming, I've often thought of that, every miracle that we have in our lives or in scripture happens after a long time of suffering where God doesn't seem to be there at all. And what we're called to do, regardless of what God wants to do, is to cry out to him because he's our father and wants to hear us talk to him. And uh, I was just talking with someone this morning, Jim actually, 
And an interesting distinction came to mind, because we might see stuff on TV and think stuff in our heart that, boy, if we just pray really powerfully and we have a really good prayer, God's going to answer our prayer. And that's not how it works. But as children of God, we would naturally cry out to God with passion, with desire, and leave the results to him. And that's exactly what we want to do right now. So Father God, you are our Father. And we pray that you'd reveal yourself to us as a father, a loving father. Maybe we had a good father, maybe we didn't. But we pray that you'd reveal yourself to us as a good father who cares for us and longs to hear our prayer. Lord, you said, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And uh, Lord, you just ask us to ask you. And I pray that you would respond to us as we ask you. Lord, we come with physical things on our heart. We think of Mary Van der Ploeg in the hospital yet again, uh, struggling with consciousness, struggling to have her brain work the right way. We think of uh, Brent, who's going through uh, flu symptoms. We think of other people who are just struggling to get through school. We think of uh, people here with back pain or uh, things we don't talk about that much. We think of uh, family members uh, like Rochelle, who are, are really struggling with cancer that seems to be growing and growing. And there's nothing really we can do to ultimately stop it, Father. And we pray that you would be in our lives in every single one of these situations, and you would be God, and you'd be made manifest, and you would bring healing, that you bring your spirit, that you bring just a sense of your presence and your actual presence, so we could walk with you. So we could walk with you, and you could be our Father, and we could be your children. We could be your children. Lord, I see these gems and growing up and so many other kids who are um, around here and around in our lives. And we just thank you for how you're moving in their lives, how the Spirit, this isn't a Spirit that's given to people when they're 18 or 25 or 35. The Spirit's given to children who are two and one and younger and three and four and ten. And your Spirit moves within our children, within those of us who are children, and convicts and inspires and compels and opens up the Word of God and has a jump into our own lives, Lord. And I thank you for that Spirit, and I ask that your Spirit your very spirit will come here this morning and jump into our lives. So that even if uh, we talk about something that isn't that relevant to each one of us, that your spirit would speak to us and that you would be relevant, that you would speak to us, give us encouragement and life abundantly and give us freedom in this place so that we can go out into this beautiful day we have here and enjoy it just to the full. Pray that you'd set us free from sin and addictions and desires that aren't from you and give us desires and, and beauty and joy and freedom that is from you so that we can be free to love, to love our parents, to love our wife, to love our husband, to love uh, the people in our lives, especially if we're not married, who are just friends and family and sisters and brothers. We pray that you would help us to pour out your love around us. Father, I pray for us as a church. Like I said earlier, we're constantly changing and growing. And I pray that as we think about organizing and how we are organized in life together groups or Bible studies or discipleship groups or the coffee spot or Wednesday night or whatever it may be, Lord, we pray that you truly would be our organizing factor and you would bind the body together in the way that you see, you see to be a perfect fit. Lord, Calvary is your church. It's not my church, like people say to me. Is that your church? No, it's not. It's not my church. It's not our church, it's your church, Lord, and we are your people. And we pray that you would build us together in perfect unity to become the body that we're called to be and that you would be our chief cornerstone, our foundation, our inspiration, our God. We pray that you'd fill us up in every way possible. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So you are the people of God, and as we uh, transition to offering and the kids can go to children's worship, let's also stand up and say hi to each other this morning, uh, welcome each other in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> are we doing the...
right here is a good spot. No. And all right, so it's a little awkward, but you know what to do. The deacons will come around, and these guys are going to sing thy word. <laughs> and this, this is your theme song, right? Yep. Yes. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> passage is uh, one verse from Psalm 119, and it's in the middle of this liturgy, so I, uh, reading that is. I'd like to invite you to take out your bulletin, and, or it's on the screen too, and read along as the gems lead us in their gems litany. <laughs> okay, hello. The Bible is the greatest story ever told. It's God's book and it conveys his radical love for the world. Jesus is the hero of God's story. God sent him to rescue us. Jesus rescues us from sin. He comforts the grief-stricken, gives strength to the weak, provides freedom for the captive, rest for the weary, provision for the needy, and eternal life to the sick and dying. We know this because the Bible tells us so. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light on my path. God gave us the light of his word to guide our steps. He gave us his spirit, so we have the power to choose well. And he gave us his son, who rescued us, so we can live as children of light. In light of this, what will you choose? We will choose to be lifelong hearers and doers of his word. We will seek to fall deeper in love with the author of life as we learn to walk in his light. Thank you for leading us in worship. 
If you're visiting and you're kind of wondering when on earth the gyms meet, they meet uh, kind of every other Wednesday night. That's just a general schedule. As it uh, works out, there's a schedule that gets laid out, um, but it's generally almost every other Wednesday night after the Wednesday night dinner in the fellowship hall. And there's, uh, there's cadets, if you heard about that, that meets on Tuesday. I think every Tuesday night almost. Um, so that's sort of uh, what goes on with that. There's also Sunday school afterwards if you're wondering how that works. Uh, and I, it's always, you know, since I've become a pastor, it's hard for me to be involved in the kids' program. I used to teach all these, uh, these programs, ministries during the church service, but obviously I have to be here uh, preaching. But I love these relationships that develop because it really is the main thing that helps kids develop into followers of God within the church. So thank you, leaders. Thank you, kids, for being awesome. All right, so let's pray, and then we'll open the Word of God. Father, uh, you give us the Bible. And I know even from talking to people in the last couple of weeks, when we're just seeking you and we open up the Bible and turn to a passage, sometimes it's difficult to understand, and we don't know exactly what it means. But Father, thank you for overall, how overall it is a, it is a, this is a light to our path and a guide to our feet. And I pray this morning that you would show us in a new way how that works and how that process plays out in the details of our lives. I pray that you would be with these girls as they continue to grow up, that you would truly help them not only to be followers of the word, but to be shining examples of what it means to be followers of the world, word. And I pray that you'd be with all of us here this morning. Speak to us, speak to our hearts, inspire us, convict us, help us to become exactly what you're calling us to be at this time and place. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're taking a one-week break from James, but as it turns out, it's really very much on the same uh, theme in terms of being doers of the word. It's saying, seek truth and do that truth. The verse is right in the middle of Psalm 119, and I'll just read it for you. You might want to open your Bibles, because I am going to refer to this, uh, this whole verse and this whole section in Psalms and a few other Psalms. It's on page uh, 647. And right there on 647, there's a little word that says nun, which I'll explain later. And then it says these words, and this is the passage. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. All right, so girls, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about how, um, well, my wife and I grew up, and also a little bit how many of us in this church grew up in terms of when it came to music. When we were little, uh, we didn't have that many choices in music. We had that hymn book in front of you, which is full of incredible, great words. And we would sing in four-part harmony. And honestly, I never really minded that. I can sing okay, and I didn't mind that so much. Um, we had an organ, and then we had a piano too. And sometimes the organist and the pianist didn't like each other very much. But uh, it all worked out in the end. Um, and then we had other songs that were kind of a different variety. These were the songs we'd sing around the campfire. Things like, Kumbaya, my Lord, Kumbaya. That was such a great song the first time I heard it, right? Beautiful song. The 500th time mm, sort of lost its uh, edge there. Uh, and we had another song, It Only Takes a Spark to Get a Fire Going. Great song for the campfire. Um, another one, The Deer Pants, uh, As a Deer Pants for Streams of Living Water, So My Soul Longs After You. That's a great song. After a while, you know, the deer keeps panting, and you think, okay, I'm done with that song. But um, great song. We didn't have that many choices, though, was my main point. We had this hymn, and then we had campfire songs. And if you grew up in another tradition, there was also gospel and probably more than a few other traditions that we are familiar with. But that was pretty much my experience. And then something happened, and that something happened was Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant. Now, this is sort of how I experienced it. Other people have shared this. You may know more than I do. But I am like 99% sure that Christian contemporary music was largely started, or at least sparked, by the work, by the artistry of Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant. Because what they did is they took Christian music and they moved it just a little bit. They brought in guitars and drums and they sang like some popular singers, but they weren't way over here so that they could be written off easy, but they were just close enough that it was recognizable, but it was different enough that people had some uh, question about it. But once they opened that door, 
a lot of people began singing Christian music that way that was accepted in the church. And how that played out in our own house was, uh, well, we would sing sort of hymnody in church, and then my dad had some records that were more of men's choruses and Handel's Messiah. I remember one of these records, by the way, we had this whole console and the record on top and the tape player and these big speakers on the bottom. It was a whole big uh, unit. Now you can fit in a thing about that big or smaller. Right? But we had this uh, record called Sing O Sing of a men's chorus, and it was really quite triumphant. I put it on because it, like 100 men would go, Sing O Sing, da 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 da. I, I would play that. It was a lot of fun. Um, but then my brother and my sister came home with a Michael W. Smith uh, record, and it almost got broke, to be honest. <laughs> Because they would play it on the record, and they were having this discussion with my folks, and my dad was uh, slightly more conservative then than he is now in terms of this type of stuff. He says, that cannot be a Christian music. Well, why not? Because it's got drums, it's got guitar, it's got people singing um, really excitedly, and you know, it was just different. And it really looked a lot like culture at that time. Of course, they got ACDC, Van Halen, Arrow, you know, all this other stuff that was really not godly at all. And it just looked really quite similar. But they had this discussion, and eventually my parents sort of realized that grudgingly, maybe it could be a Christian music um, from Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith. And now we sort of take it for granted. We got all sorts of things. Most of the music we sing here on Sunday morning, at least a lot of it comes out of that train of tradition. Now we're going back to hymns. But that's how it started. Now, why do I bring all this up? Well, partly because any time I hear thy word is a lamp to my feet, I can't get out of my head Amy Grant's version of it because it's really one of the first songs I listened to and that was the only option besides the other one. And I just listened to this record over and over again and just reminds me of that whole era. The other reason I bring it up, because at this same time, my brother and sister were in high school and college, and they were having to make choices that were um, choices that my parents didn't have to make, really choices to follow God in some areas and choices to follow their own desire in other areas. And in the same room that they had this discussion with my folks about uh, Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant, they had other discussions about how to follow God. And this is um, a bit weird to share. I think it's okay, though. Um, my, one of my sisters was in high school, and, um, you know, you don't always agree with your parents about how to dress when you're a high school girl, right? And so she came home with these pants, and they were nice white jean pants, but they were a little tight. And it was always kind of funny for me thinking back to this because as she walked, the little creases in her pants would kind of go, rah, 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 rah. and I remember my parents making her walk across the living room floor and saying, that's too tight, there's creases, it's too tight. And she's like, oh my goodness, you're so ridiculous and old fashioned. And like, I don't know who won, I don't know what happened to the pants. The point was, my dad's point was this, you're dressing to lure and not to be pure, right? My sister's point was like, look, I'm just in high school. I want to be beautiful. I want to enjoy life. And I want you to stop talking to me about how I'm supposed to dress, right? But there was a discussion and a discernment process about how to follow God's word. I guess what I want to bring out this morning is simply this. These songs that we sing on Sunday morning are fabulous and great and true. But when it gets into the details, the way we actually work out our lives, suddenly these songs don't make it necessarily easy to know exactly what to do. The truth is that in the details of our lives, away from Sunday morning, sometimes it's very difficult to either know what the right choice is, or even if we know it, to make that right choice. The Word of God is beautiful and true, but all of us, whether we're young or whether we're old, always have these choices to make that are, aren't so easy, either to know or then to do. So I think, to some extent, I've always struggled a little bit with knowing exactly uh, what to do and how to follow God. Um, but these verses here in Psalm 119 are powerful. I want to get into this text here. If you look at Psalm 119, verse 105, it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And right above that it says, Noon. Well, what's that noon about anyway? Does this mean none? Does it mean uh, something else? Noon, it turns out, is one of the letters of the, Greek, of the Hebrew alphabet. 
Now this is the Hebrew alphabet, and you may know a little bit about the Hebrew alphabet and the way of writing. It goes from right to left, and it's Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hei, Vav, Zion, Het, Tet, Yog, and so on and so forth. I had to learn this in seminary, and I actually liked it, and I really, uh, really got into it. I learned to type in Hebrew eventually, which was kind of unnecessary, but it was fun. So the point is, in this passage, the writer of Psalm 119 is taking every letter of the Hebrew alphabet and writing a section... And each line of each section starts with that letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it starts with Ayin, Aleph, and that first section is all about the Word of God and all about how the Word of God is important in that person's life. And then it goes on to Beit, Gimel, Dalit, He, Vav, Zion, on and on and on. And if you read through the Bible, you get to Psalm 119, you think, why did this guy do this? Why am I supposed to read this whole thing? Because it just keeps going. But if you think about it from the other side, in terms of the person who's writing it, what's going on? I think partly, it's obvious, he's celebrating the power of the Word of God in someone's life. But on the other hand, on a deeper level, perhaps, I think it's indicative of someone who is struggling to obey the Word of God in every area of life. And so in as, active, as an act of devotion, he, or possibly she, but he, is taking the time to write down how important the Word of God is for every letter of their alphabet. And how important the Word of God is for every area of life symbolized by using every area of the alphabet. That's probably what's going on. And like I said, I know a lot about Hebrew. Well, a little bit. But of course, this is a completely different culture two or 3,000 years ago. And we really can't get into the, the depths of what happened in that culture. But what is true is this. The struggle that was then is also now. That even though we know the Word of God, it's very hard to follow it in every single circumstance. I was reading through Psalm 101 this week, which is in the daily scripture readings that are on the back on the sermon resource table behind those windows there. And Psalm 101 popped up, and you know, I've probably read this, well, a lot, because I've read through the Bible um, again, again. Um, but I've never really read exactly what it says in this passage before. Really, Psalm 101 is another um, poem about us needing to follow the Word of God. And it says this, I will sing of your love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praise. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? So here we have this, someone who wants to obey God, but then he says, when will you come to me? So there's this disjunction, it's hard. And you think, when is God going to show up in my life? When is God going to answer my prayers? How come it's so difficult? But then he says this, I will walk in my house with a blameless heart, I will set before my eyes no vile thing. So let me ask you this. Where do you struggle most? In life? Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's at school. Maybe it's when you drive. Some of us, I would bet, it's at home. We get home, work is done, we want to relax, the entertainment choices are there. You know, our, our wife isn't sort of our supervisor. She can't fire us. Or maybe we're just there alone. Actually, she can fire you, by the way. But we don't want to do that. And, uh, you know, there's just options there that maybe aren't anywhere else. And that's why this passage is so powerful to me this week. As it says, I will walk in my house with blameless heart. I will set before my eyes no vile thing. And it goes on. No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. And it just is this indicator like he wants to follow God, but then he makes specific statements about how he's going to do that. So in my life, I've struggled to follow God in different ways at different times. I think the first one was figuring out, okay, my parents want me to do this, and I'm not really sure I want to do that. And I remember one story example um, for in particular was, I think, you know, yet again, I wasn't seeing quite eye to eye with my mom, and my mom wanted me to do particular things and was having a bad day, and I probably wasn't having a great day either. And we just were in some conflict. So I walked out of the house, and I climbed up this tree that I like to climb, I like to climb. Uh, you might have noticed that. And I went on a branch, and I sort of sat there and where the branches stood up and sat there for a while. I went there quite often. I just was sitting there thinking. I remember thinking to myself, you know, Life isn't that easy. I'm in a lot of conflict with my folks and other people at this time. We had just moved, but I, 
I did realize this. I want to follow the truth that is in the Bible. I sensed something there, even if I didn't know a lot about the Bible. I want to follow the truth that's in the Word of God. I didn't know the song yet because it hadn't come out. Thy word is a lamp to my feet. As I got older, um, I still wanted to follow the Word of God, but I started drifting. And I've shared this fairly often, but some of you are new, haven't heard this. Um, I, sh I was just basically drifting, and I wasn't making horrible moral choices, but they weren't certainly the best. And at that time, all of a sudden, uh, someone taught me about prayer, and I realized that if I prayed, I had this experience where if I prayed, God would begin to answer my prayers and begin to do things in my life that really uh, couldn't happen any other way. And one of you, uh, one of, someone here who just became a Christian recently shared this with me, how you know, if one or two things happen, that can be chalked up to coincidence. But if, if things happen on a continual basis, you, know, you start to believe that something else is going on. And this is what happened to me. And pretty soon God was answering prayers. And I thought, you know, maybe if the God of heaven and earth is willing to listen to me, I might be interested in a relationship with him. And that helped clear up the, the morality stuff. In the last three or four years, I've had challenges that I'd never really have had before, and just in terms of sheer um, busyness, sheer number of things to do. And even if there was the exact number of things that I was supposed to do right now in my life, and that's all I had to do, the fact is there's a lot of options for me to do, and I'm tempted to do those options. It's not bad things. It's just busy work that maybe I don't need to do. So as I go through life in the last three or four years, it's this constant challenge to do the things that are set before me that I actually need to do. And I feel like, and I've shared this, sometimes it seems like the Spirit of God says to go left, and I say, but I really want to work on this. And sometimes the Spirit of God says to go over there, and I say, but I just want to get this work done. And, and so it's this constant struggle to say, actually do what the Spirit of God is leading me to do. And I feel like, honestly, it seems like sometimes God says no, and I say yes. Sometimes God says yes to particular things, and I say no. And uh, I was talking to Lucette Lasley a while back, and totally out of the blue, I wasn't talking about any of this. She brought up uh, this very helpful way of thinking about this, which I sort of immediately latched onto, and I use in my own thinking. And I want to share it with you uh, now. So basically what she was saying is she mentors her own kids. She was telling them, look, you can't turn a no from God into a yes. You can't do it. If God says no, don't do that. You can't sort of take that no and say, well, but maybe if I just do it for 10 minutes, it'll be okay. Right? If God says no, I don't want you to be that person in terms of uh, vocation or what you're called to do. You can't say, but God, I really, really want to do it. You can't take a no from God and turn it into a yes. But yet that's exactly what we try to do all the time. And so that's why I have my truth garden here, uh, my garden of flags, I guess, to illustrate exactly how we do this, how we try to turn a no into a yes. So um, we have speak truth. And obviously, sometimes you don't have to speak the whole truth to somebody. Like, you don't have to tell them exactly what you think of them. But this whole temptation to speak things that aren't the truth sometimes gets in our way. So it, the Bible says, don't lie. And uh, the teacher says, hey, did you do that at recess? We say, no, no, I didn't do that. Um, we tell things to people that aren't true all the time. So we take the truth and we say, well, what if I just, I don't wreck the truth. I'll just sort of bend the truth a little bit and turn it into something different, and I'll, uh, I'll do this. God says no, and we try to turn it into a yes. And then there's, um, there's money wisdom. And we know what money wisdom is. You give to God. All of our money belongs to God. But we think, you know, it sure would be nice if I did that, and it sure would be great if I could do that thing. And so we take the wisdom from God to, to uh, spend for his purposes and not for our purposes. And we say, you know, this is good wisdom, but how about, you know, no one really knows my finances anyway, so how about if I just sort of, uh, you know, bend it a little bit like that and then just hide it back here and I'll go to church and give some money and no one will see what I'm doing here. All right. There's stuff wisdom. We know we're not supposed to live with stuff. It says don't worry about things because you'll have enough tomorrow. Each day has enough worry of its own. And we fill our houses full of stuff, and we get latched onto it. I need this stuff. This really hit me. Uh, a while back, we were watching this show called The Hoarders, and um, Marcia knew I was keeping too much stuff already. <laughs> Our basement was so full, you could literally hardly walk in it. But I was going to fix it someday. I was really going to fix it. I can fix these things, and I'm watching this show going, I'm so, um, I so don't want to be that person. 
And this truth from Scripture is really quite plain, but, you know, we take stuff and we get more stuff and then we have more stuff and then we ignore the truth of Scripture and we bend this one every which way because we live in a culture that promotes stuff and we turn this right on its head and we jam it all up and then we say, why isn't it working so good, God? Why can't I fix the stuff that I have? Why is there so much? All right, life goals. We pursue our own goals all the time. I don't really probably even need to bend this one, but... And we just, honestly, we probably just ignore that one sometimes. Entertainment. This is, uh, this is a big one. Honestly, the Bible says, whatever is true, noble, holy, pure, think on such things. And we say, I'll do that in church. This movie's really good, right? We think of all sorts of things that aren't true, noble, holy, pure. We do it when we watch articles about, uh, about the political things going on. We hear every little piece of, piece of dirt these people have done. And we say, yeah. And it didn't fit on the flag on one thing. So it says, entertainment. And honestly, sometimes with our entertainment, we need to not enter at all because it's jacking up our lives. And we think, well, how come I can't get close to God? Um, I'm guilty. We're all guilty. This is the one from last week, irritation versus patience. It says, don't anger. There's so much of our irritation in our lives that's simply not biblical. But I think we don't confront ourselves, allow ourselves to be confronted by the fact that our irritation is not from God, nor is it godly. And so we just sort of endorse it. We're not being sinful, really. We're just not being like Jesus, as it turns out. Irritation versus patient. God is patient. And we're called to be so also. Right relationships, we sort of, um, yeah, this is another flag that we sort of throw out wholesale sometimes. Pride versus humility. Um, you know, humility is the way forward. And I think all of us have some element of pride. You know, there's something in my own life that uh, uh, every time I get prideful, this happened when I was a little kid even, I was on a skateboard, and I was thinking, man, I'm good at this. That skateboard just went, boom, right out from under me, and I hurt my wrist. So hopefully God does that to us, but if we're like, walking in pride, this can be such a thing, and we get to see the anger and dysfunction. People around us see it, and we're the last person to see it. I'm not going to bend that one. Seeking the Lord is something that we're called to do, but even as your pastor, I think so many times I think, oh, I just got to do this project. I don't have time to seek God. What would happen if I would spend two or three hours seeking God every morning? I might not get other stuff done, but I might, I might be far more effective. We might be far more effective as a church if we all do this. Seek the Lord while well, he may be found, and then he comes to us. Forgiveness. You know what that is. We turn this thing on its head, but you don't know what they did to me. No, I don't. But um, God does. And this is the path he walked. He forgave his own people for crucifying him on the cross. This is what Jesus does. He says, if you don't forgive others, why would I forgive you? Challenging statement. Challenging statement. But he gives us the Spirit's power to do just that. <laughs> Talking about people. You know, I've talked about this. It's helpful as people live in society to have conversations about other people to figure out if what they're doing is right and how we want to live and how to help them walk with God. But there's a line that we cross where it becomes slander or becomes running people down, or it becomes gossip. And that line that it crosses is when it becomes sort of sickly sweet and delicious to you to talk about the dysfunction in somebody else's life. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks. But we're called to care for people, and running them down with our tongues isn't what we're called to do. Let's see if I can make this into a tongue. I don't think I can, but... <laughs> Have to work on that for next week. All right, so we've been that one. And finally, the law. This is, uh, you know, just the law of the land. We're called to obey the law of the land. But, you know, when it says stop, really what it means is slow down mostly until you can go. It doesn't really mean stop. Um, when it says 55, well, that actually means 60. But I'm in a hurry, so it means 65, 70, 80. And these people all around me, they're so stupid and ignorant anyway. I mean, I could just drive however I want to drive. And well, I just drive crazy. That's just what I do. You know, God didn't call you to drive crazy. I had to deal with this because Marsha, on one hand, obeys every law, almost every law. That There's a few, but I won't tell you which ones those are. 
But Marsha's first inclination is to obey the rules. And honestly, my first inclination is not to obey the rules. And so at the seminary where we both went, there was a, a thing, an uh, exit that you really, it was just an entrance. But I was like, it's an exit because I can drive. You know, it looks, it works just fine to exit. And every time I did that, she'd be like, don't do that. Like, oh, stop talking to me. And I'd exit and exit. You had to drive around. It took like three minutes to drive around. And I just didn't want to do it. Finally, the Spirit of God sort of got through to me and says, look, here's the deal. Everyone must obey the governing authorities for they are put there by God. Like, I don't want to. So it doesn't matter if you don't want to. And it turns out three minutes to drive around ain't that big a deal. And so I, I don't do that anymore. But it took a long time. This law is best, we think, law is best when it's applied to other people. But God actually wants us to obey the law. Obviously, if God, uh, if we're not supposed to worship God in the country, we're in, we can worship God. But that's generally what we're called to do. You might be getting the picture by now. There's other areas. There's other areas, beautiful things that we're supposed to follow God and sometimes we don't. There's truth that God might give us in times of darkness. There's things here that God has called us to do that I ain't talked about, but you know what God's called you to do and you may be doing it or you may be convicted or maybe God's going to lead you into truth in the future. And there's, I ran out of things to write, so there's another flag. All right, so how this works is in life, you may be growing up, you may have grown up in a church, you may be growing up in a church like this where you really got taught how to follow God and you got everything handed to you. You knew exactly how to live and that was beautiful and wonderful and you may be still walking in that, but maybe like me, you took a few of these rules and bent them all up to suit your own purposes. That is one way we bend the rules of God. It could be that you maybe are just kind of weak in some areas. All of us have weakness in some areas and great strengths in other areas. And there's just some natural tendency like I was talking about with Marsha and I. It could be that you didn't grow up in a church. You didn't grow up with really any strong sense of morality. Or even if you did, your parents taught you something that's really quite bent. Either way, in life, we get to these situations where we have um, all of this tied together. If I had more time, I could tie this up into a, uh, a sort of a structure. We have this mess. And this is what we walk around with. And we sing this song, we sing, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a guide to my path. But this often, maybe not this messed up, some aspects of our lives are actually this bent and this broken. And how do we get that? How do we teach your girls how to take this stuff and become who God has called you to be. So you learn to apply this. You learn to put this in your life. And the answer really is a couple stages of growth. One is simply learning to listen to God. If you're not familiar with this, these are some categories by which God speaks to us. Scripture, spirit, common sense. You know, sometimes the spirit tells us to do things that may not make sense at first, but ultimately... Uh, they make sense. And as you talk to other people, they become very sensible. The counsel of the saints and circumstantial signs. Let's skip a verse here. In John 14, verse 7, there's a great passage that says, For I am the way and the truth and the life. No one who comes to me will be put to shame. And that's one thing that I want to bring out, especially for any kids' program, but for our kids. Because one thing to teach you guys how to live is another thing to introduce you guys to Jesus. And if we were just teaching you about a bunch of rules and a bunch of regulations and then telling you to go out and do that, all of us would be in big, big trouble because there's simply not enough power in us to obey the things that we know we're called to do. But that's the power of Christianity. Because Jesus says that I am the way and the truth and the life. And any time we have an area in our life that's all bent up and don't look anything like what we're supposed to do, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he's willing to help us take our mess and become who God has called us to be. So many times when people come to me with presenting problems, or parents come to me about their kids with presenting problems, I often think and reflect again and realize, and sometimes I teach this, that the presenting problem is never, never the problem. The problem underneath it is always an issue of something happened in the past 
that Jesus can go back and heal and help us find healing from. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In a relationship with him, if we have that, all this other stuff uh, comes and becomes beautiful. This is a passage in Psalm 107. And Psalm 107 is really a very memorable song. It, it talks about all these different kinds of situations that people get into, and then it talks about how God rescues them. And this verse first came to mind out of a, a freedom appointment in which uh, a person in the sort of a vision had uh, a vision of huge chains and a padlock wrapped around some area of sin in their life that they couldn't get at to have cleansed by God. And so the people that were walking with this person uh, prayed and thought for a while, and then God gave them this verse. What God does is he cuts down, he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. He sets us free from the sin and the dysfunction and the disorder and the inclinations in our life. It doesn't matter that I was born with a pretty strong predisposition to ignore the laws around me. God can come in and make me new. It doesn't matter if you were born uh, of a family that didn't teach you any of this. What God does is he comes in and gradually takes his stuff in our lives and it begins to form and reshape it. I'm going to do it here so I don't wreck the carpet. And reshape it into something that's just really um, more beautiful than we ever really could have realized. And you're thinking, okay, he's up there bending this rod straight and doesn't look that good. But really, this is about how awkward it is to become a follower of Jesus Christ and get this stuff straight. God longs to do this in each area of our lives. He longs to take this mess and help us to become who God's called us to be. And eventually, eventually, we become formed in the image of God. I want to tell you just a quick story that illustrates to me how God does this. So years ago, years ago, um, I went to this conference and I wanted more power. And as part of that prayer process, someone pulled out a book that talked about sin. I said, well, I didn't want to talk about sin. I want to talk about power. And, but it turns out that I needed to confess some things, get rid of some things, so the Spirit could fill me and equip me to be who he called me to be. And this booklet, as it turns out, was written by a guy named Neil Anderson. And Neil Anderson wrote a book at one point because he was working for a seminary. And the seminarians there were really good at sort of parsing Hebrew and talking about the doctrine of God and other things. But they had these morality issues in their life that were really, well, messing them up. Messing them up. And so what Neil Anderson did is he took a bunch of scripture passages and put them in categories and then presented it to the students to say, okay, here's your life. Here's what you believe functionally. And here's what scripture says. Do they match? And of course, as you go through different areas of life, you find out that they might not match quite so good. But as he did this, people found freedom that they had never found before. And so I found freedom that day. Through this, I've been able to help a lot of other people find freedom. And tomorrow morning, for breakfast here at church, Neil Anderson, the guy who wrote this a long time ago, is going to be here speaking because Set Free Ministries invited him to come speak at this church. And it's so um, powerful, I guess, for me to see that God is in this from start to finish, and he just keeps confirming it to me time and time again that what we're called to do is not so much be perfect, but to be on the journey allowing the Spirit to speak to us to help us become who God's called us to be. I'd like to invite you to pray. So Jesus Christ, you are the way and the truth and the life. So many times we hide our sin because we're ashamed, but you say even in that verse that anyone who trusts in you will never be put to shame. And so this morning, if there's something that's in our heart that's in your heart, about some area where you've been struggling and you want God to reform you, to reshape you according to the truth that is in Scripture, I want to invite you to, to speak to God about that even right now.
Lord, you said that you can break through gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. And I pray that you would do that in our hearts. Lord, we want to be people who are truly equipped to have your word be a light to our feet and a guide to our path. And I pray that you would do just that in our lives this week and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, girls, you ready to lead us in one more song? You're kind of messed up. Oh, you can move it. Would you stand if you're able? And we're going to have the gems lead us and shine, Jesus, shine. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's workmanship. You were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, but God prepared in advance for you to do. As you go to do those good works, as you go to live your life, wherever you've been called to live, may you be filled with the Holy Spirit. May you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, and may you experience the love and abundance of God our Father. Amen.
One piece.